Wednesday the 16th of December 1998, Lewis County, Washington State, the United States. A dispatcher warmed their hands on a hot cup of coffee as the sunrise broke the morning's chill. It had been unusually quiet for the dispatcher, though it was the calm before a storm of twists, turns, lies and murder. This is the case of Rhonda Reynolds. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve deep into this case, I'd just like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. I'm sure you've heard of Magellan TV before, especially on my channel, and it's not without good reason. Magellan TV is my absolute go-to for all of my documentary needs, with a wide range of documentaries from space, nature to true crime, and with 4K at no extra cost, it's the perfect place to wind down after a long day while still learning something new. Magellan TV actually adds between 15 to 20 hours of brand new content every single week, so if you're worried about running out of true crime content to watch, worry no more. I've just watched Scotland's Murder Mysteries. Delve into the notorious murder mysteries of Scotland using primary sources such as police reports, medical records, and personal letters. Crime experts piece together the evidence to discover the truth behind some of Scotland's grim events. True stories dissected by legal professionals and then reconstructed. Be sure to use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments and use your one month free trial to go and watch Scotland's Murder Mysteries and once you've finished it, dive deep into Majan TV's extensive true crime collection. As I said before, new documentaries like Scotland's Murder Mysteries are added to Magellan TV Weekly, so don't sleep on this offer. Grab your one-month free trial using the links below, and thank you to Magellan TV for constantly supporting this channel and making content like this video possible. On a chilly morning on the 16th of December 1998, the Lewis County Sheriff's Office received a call from Mr. Ron Reynolds. The dispatcher listened as Ron informed them of something even more chilling than the winter morning. His wife, Rhonda Reynolds, was dead. Rhonda Reynolds was born on the 16th of September 1965 in Spokane, Washington, to Barbara Thompson, a young mother who would raise her mostly alone, as Rhonda's father would leave when Rhonda was only three years old. Her mother described her as an upbeat and energetic child to raise. Growing up, Rhonda loved horses and spent much of her younger years riding casually, as well as participating in show jumping. Her mother would often lovingly refer to her as, quote, hell on wheels in that regard. She was fiery, full of life, and overall excited to take on any challenges life presented her with. Rhonda was very young when she decided that she wanted to move to Toledo and pursue a career in law enforcement, and at the age of 22, she made that dream a reality. She enjoyed being an officer, but was unfortunately hurt on the job in 1994, rendering her unable to work until she had recovered. During this leave, Rhonda was accused of purposefully taking both her salary and her workers' compensation pay. While she was indeed granted both forms of payment, she stated that it was an accident and misunderstanding. Regardless of intent, this incident left a negative mark on her name, causing her to resign from her job as an officer not long after. During her time on the force, she married her first husband, a man called Mark Liberdi, a fellow officer, ex-marine, and single father of three children. Those who were close to Rhonda at the time described her as excited and in love. She was very happy with Mark and quickly came to love her new stepchildren as well. Their marriage was fairly happy and stable until Rhonda's aforementioned injury in 1994. 
After their marriage became rocky, the couple sought marriage counselling through their local church, hoping to rekindle their love for one another and continue their relationship. Their counsellor happened to be a popular man within the church and the principal of the local elementary school, Mr. Ron Reynolds. When the troubled young couple began therapy, Ron and his own wife were in the process of separating, surely not the best omen of a marriage counsellor, if I may say so. The couple attended therapy with Mr. Reynolds multiple times, trying desperately to save their relationship and continue moving forward together. However, Rhonda and Mark's marriage could unfortunately not be salvaged, and the two ended up separating in late 1997. It is at that point that, according to Ron, Rhonda called him, confessing her interest in him, and from this point, their relationship progressed quickly. As I mentioned before, Ron was the principal of the local elementary school, a man many in the community trusted and liked. He was known to the community as a trustworthy and compassionate person. It was this that drew Rhonda to him, and in January of 1998, only five weeks after the finalisation of her divorce from Mark, Ron and Rhonda were married. After their new marriage was finalised, Rhonda moved into a new home with Ron and his five sons, two of whom were teenagers. Though the boys came from Ron's first marriage, Rhonda came to love Ron's sons as much as her own, and like she had with Mark's children before she welcomed them into her life. She was excited to become part of the boys' lives, and was described as having a quote, warm and friendly relationship with them. While Rhonda's relationship with most of the boys was friendly, one of the two teens, Jonathan, who was aged 16 at that time, had a notably rocky and rather distressing relationship with his new stepmother. Rhonda described to various people in her life instances where Jonathan would be aggressive and even blatantly sexual towards her, with many of these instances being definable as borderline harassment or even outright harassment. In one incident described by Rhonda, Jonathan had come into the bathroom whilst she was in the shower. Rhonda claims that Jonathan had pulled back the shower curtain and stared at her while she was entirely nude, something she claims happened on several occasions. However, this time would be different. This time Rhonda had had enough. According to her accounts, Rhonda stepped out of the shower and forced Jonathan downstairs with her to confront Ron. She told Ron that this behaviour must stop, and demanded that Ron take action to reprimand Jonathan and ensure that it would not happen again. Both Ron and Jonathan were later denied that this ever happened. The issues in the relationship were not exclusive to Rhonda and Jonathan. Both Ron and Rhonda had their complaints and accusations in regard to each other as well. Ron made claims that Rhonda was opening credit cards in his name without his consent, running up large bills worth over $20,000. If this were to be true, that would have meant that Rhonda was committing forgery and fraud, a quite serious accusation. On the other hand, Rhonda accused Ron of cheating, stating he was having an affair with his ex-wife. According to Rhonda, this affair began only a few months into their new marriage. It should be noted that after later investigation, no evidence of Rhonda committing fraud or forgery were ever uncovered. However, Ron did eventually confess that he was indeed seeing his ex-wife while being married to Rhonda, with the affair beginning sometime in November of 1998. Though at the time, these were just claims and accusations. The damage was done. Ron and Rhonda's relationship was quickly deteriorating, torn to shreds by tension and distrust. By mid-December of 1998, only 11 months after the pair were married, Ron and Rhonda's relationship was over. On the 15th of December, Rhonda was finishing packing the rest of her belongings that were still in Ron's house, preparing to vacate the home and move elsewhere. She actually had a close friend over to help her sort out her belongings. Whilst packing and moving Rhonda's things, they spoke about her plans moving forward. Though the separation had happened rather quickly, Rhonda was already planning her next moves and assessing her options. Alongside her more long-term plans, Rhonda and her friend discussed her plans to visit her family in Spokane for Christmas. Despite the chaos and social tensions, Rhonda was ready to carry on and continue moving forward in her life. 
Among the various things Rhonda and her friends sorted through was a holstered pistol. Her friend says that Rhonda looked uneasy when handling the weapon and chose to hand it to him instead. He later stated that out of habit, he removed the gun from the holster and unloaded it before placing it back in the holster as he had a history of working with firearms and was not comfortable leaving it loaded. He says he asked Rhonda what to do with the weapon as its presence was obviously making her feel uneasy. Rhonda asked him to put it in a drawer across the room and once the gun was safely tucked away, the two continued packing. Rhonda's friend stayed with her and helped her pack until about midnight when he finally left the house and drove back home. Once he was home, he received a call from Rhonda. In regards to this call, the friend said the following, quote, A little after midnight, I got a phone call from her on my cell phone. She sounded pretty calm, said she had worked some things out, that she got some sleep, that she felt a little better, and that she was going to head to Spokane to spend a couple of days with her mum and grandmother and brother, and asked if I'd take her to the airport. Unfortunately, these plans would never take place. Rhonda did not sleep in the bed with Ron that night, but on the floor of the closet, something her mother says that she would do when she was upset and was not comfortable sharing the bed with Ron. At some point between 1 and 3 in the morning, while Rhonda slept peacefully, one singular shot was fired into Rhonda's head just behind her right ear, killing her instantly. Though both Ron and all of his children were home in this time frame, none reported hearing any struggle, nor the gunshot. Rhonda would remain there, curled up under an electric blanket on the floor with a pillow over her head, until a little after 6am, when Ron would wake up to the sound of his alarm clock. Once he was awake, Ron claims to have found that Rhonda had left the bed and searched for her, finding her on the floor of the closet before making the call to Lewis County Sheriff's Office. According to many accounts, when first responders arrived at the Reynolds' house, the scene was not protected and preserved the way that it should have been. According to those presents, many people were coming in and out of the home without proper procedure, checks, or questioning. For example, even though they were only a few dozen feet away from the master bedroom when Rhonda had been shot, the three youngest sons of Ron were allowed to leave the scene without any questioning. No one at the scene, including Ron, had their hands swabbed for a gunpowder residue test. During her autopsy, Rhonda's hands were tested for gunpowder residue, but the tests were not conclusive, unable to determine whether or not her hands were close to the gun when it had been fired. Before official police photographs were taken of the scene, an officer allegedly moved the gun from where it had laid originally. Various accounts of the situation cite other things around the scene being moved, but they were not specific nor as confirmable as the moving of the gun. In an official report, an officer states, quote, Again, I did take some photographs for him of the weapon, and the weapon, when it was removed, was in the victim's left hand. The hand was covered by the blanket, and the gun was in the blanket. As the quite above pointed out, the gun used to kill Rhonda was laying on top of the blanket near her left hand. Her hands, however, were still under the blanket, and she was laying in what would later be described as a, quote, natural sleeping position. In regards to the bed, reports from the lead detectives said, quote, There was no pillow on her side, but the covers were pulled up and did not appear to be in any form of disarray, usually associated with having been slept in. The left side of the bed, however, did appear to have been slept in. In other words, the left side of the bed in which Ron typically slept was messy, indicating that Ron had indeed slept there. Rhonda's side of the bed, however, was neat, only missing the pillow. And as you will recall, Rhonda was found with a pillow over her head when Ron woke up and called the authorities. In the bedroom and bathroom, various bags of Rhonda's possessions were left alone, still packed and ready for the airport. Another strange factor regarding the firearm was that after tests were run on the gun, it was discovered that it had no fingerprints on it at all, whatsoever. The final strange clue at the scene was written across the mirror of the master bathroom, a sentence in Rhonda's handwriting in bright red lipstick, quote, I love you, please call me, followed by a phone number. There were many aspects of Rhonda's death that did not make sense to the lead investigator, Detective Berry. 
Very early on, Barry had felt that Rhonda's death was not suicide. Too many of his questions had answers that led the investigation towards the incident being foul play. Why would Rhonda kill herself if she had both long-term and short-term plans? If Rhonda had indeed fired the gun, why were her hands underneath the blankets when officers arrived on the scene? And why would the gun have been near her left hand if Rhonda was right-handed? These questions did not lean in the direction of the cause of death being a suicide. Too many of the variables were simply impossible to lead to a suicide conclusion. However, despite Barry's ongoing work on the case, a few months into the investigation, something shifted. As Detective Barry searched for clues and desperately tried to find closure for what he believed to be a homicide, everything came to a screeching halt. Around seven months after that dark day in December, Rhonda Reynolds' death was determined by the Lewis County Sheriff's Office to have been a suicide. Both those who knew Rhonda and Detective Berry himself were shocked. None of them had felt that Rhonda was in the place to kill herself. To them, it was truly and sincerely inconceivable. Detective Berry would continue to press for reopening of Rhonda's case until the 1st of January 2001, when he would be demoted from lead investigator back to deputy. He later claims that he'd been told to, quote, leave the case alone after being reassigned to road duty. In June of 2001, after months of mistreatment by the sheriff's office, Barry left the department, saying that Rhonda's case was not the first time a case had been arbitrarily closed as a suicide despite suspicions of foul play. Documents from another investigator within the sheriff's department from the 9th of February 2001 stated that they felt it was a staged crime scene. This document cited details such as the electric blankets that Rhonda was wrapped in as suspicious. Rhonda's mother, as well as others close to her, firmly asserted that Rhonda would never have used an electric blanket, as she was scared of using them, believing she could easily burn herself while using one. With that fact in mind, it is easy to see why the notion that Rhonda would be willingly using an electric blanket at all, let alone covering her entire body, was highly unusual. Criminal Deputy Doench, the author of the documents, also theorized that the use of the electric blanket could have been strategic. He posits that the use of the blanket could have been an attempt to slow the inevitable process of rigor mortis. You see, when someone passes away, the body will go entirely stiff after some time before relaxing again. After approximately three to six hours, a deceased person's body will become completely rigid. This process has various steps and is affected by several factors, such as temperature. This fact is where Doench's theory comes from. By altering the temperature of the body in some way, such as using a heated blanket, it is possible to tamper with the process of rigor mortis, causing the exact time of death to be somewhat harder to determine accurately. Regardless of the arguments made within the 2001 document, the sheriff's office maintained the original conclusion and stated that it was, quote, based on detective work to date and a preponderance of information. However, it would come out later that there was, as many had expected, likely more to the conclusion. A year later, in 2002, it would be confirmed by an attorney that a few months into the investigation surrounding Rhonda's death, Ron Reynolds prepared to sue the Lewis County Sheriff's Office. Ron stated at the time of the lawsuit that it was due to the Sheriff's Department's mismanagement of the crime scene and overall handling of the case. This sentiment is maintained by Ron to this day, but is seen as suspicious by many. As quickly as a week after Ron's attorney threatened the Sheriff's Office with the lawsuit, Rhonda's death was labelled a suicide and effectively closed. With Rhonda's death officially labelled a suicide and Barry gone from the force, things seemed bleak for Rhonda's loved ones. Many of them still felt that Rhonda simply could not have killed herself. More specifically, many of them felt that Ron Reynolds, or even his son Jonathan Reynolds, had murdered her. Many questions were left unanswered or wholly ignored by the closing of the case, and Rhonda's mother, Barbara, couldn't allow them to continue being ignored. Barbara dedicated her life to finding the answers she felt were truly out there regarding Rhonda's death. She partnered with Barry, the former detective, hiring him as a private investigator to continue where he left off on Rhonda's case. 
The two appealed to the court multiple times to have Rhonda's death reinvestigated over the next decade, citing evidence that had been overlooked or new evidence found by Berry. The key pieces of evidence that they were desperate to have reviewed were very notable. The first bit of evidence was originally from Ron Reynolds' statement to the police. Ron stated that Rhonda was very suicidal that night, and he was worried she would try to hurt herself. Because of this, he states he and Rhonda sat in bed awake until 5 in the morning. This, however, makes no sense, as when the scene was originally searched and photographed, it was very clear that only Ron's side of the bed had been slept in, not Rhonda's. The second piece also comes from this statement. Ron claimed he had woken up to his alarm going off at 6am, but he had not heard the gunshots that killed Rhonda mere feet from where he slept. It is obviously strange to think someone would be awoken by a regular alarm clock, but not the firing of a gun. In fact, sound tests would later prove that a gunshot would have been significantly louder than the sound of his alarm clock. The third thing discussed was the message left in lipstick on the mirror by Rhonda, asking that Ron call her. This note displayed behaviour abnormal for someone who was considering taking their own life. Finally, and likely most importantly, the issue of the angle of the gunshot wound was brought up, as well as the placements of the gun. Both the placement of the gun and the wound were not cohesive with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. This point will be revisited and explained in greater detail later on in this coverage. Despite all of these points, it would not be until 2009 that, by utilising a somewhat obscure state law and filing a suit against the coroner, Barbara's wish would come true. A judge would look over and reevaluate Rhonda's case. Rhonda's case would be the first case to ever receive a judicial review in the history of the state of Washington. This brief evaluation was presented to a jury who deliberated on it before casting their judgment. They decided that based on the judge's re-evaluation of the case files, that Rhonda's death was not a suicide. Originally, when the judge made the ruling, the coroner at the time, the same coroner who had ruled Rhonda's death a suicide in 1999, refused to change the death certificate. The coroner appealed, believing that Rhonda's cause of death should not be changed, which Barbara Cross appealed. In the end, Rhonda's cause of death was indeed updated to quote, undetermined, but only after a new coroner was elected in early 2011. This was a victory for Barbara, Berry, and Rhonda's loved ones, with major implications. First, it meant that Rhonda's death certificate would no longer have suicide labelled as her cause of death, it would instead say undetermined. Second, this change left the door open for further official investigation. Because if Rhonda had not killed herself, then who had? In mid-2011, a chance to try to answer this question officially arose. A coroner's inquest began to re-examine the evidence of Rhonda's death to determine if her cause of death should once again be changed. This time from undetermined to homicide. If her death was ruled a homicide, that left room for possible arrests and justice for those who might have done it. For those who do not know, a coroner's inquest is not a true trial. A coroner's inquest is an inquiry into the possible cause of death in situations of sudden, violent or otherwise unexplained deaths, either with or without a jury present. Thanks to a Washington law dating back to 1863, depending on the results of the inquest in cases where inquests have a jury present, the coroner may issue arrest warrants for those the jury felt were involved. In the case of Rhonda Reynolds, a jury was indeed present, and it would become their duty to decide if Rhonda had indeed been murdered all of those years ago in 1998. The inquest was launched by the new coroner, who felt that much of the evidence reviewed in the judicial review was very important. Two key pieces of evidence mentioned before, the angle of the gunshot wound and the placement of the gun were re-examined by a ballistics expert who determines that 1. The gun was originally found beside her left hand on top of the blanket, facing towards her head. If Rhonda had used the firearm to shoot herself, the recoil of the gun would have pushed it away from her head and body altogether. In other words, the gun realistically would have been pointing the opposite direction if Rhonda had fired it in that capacity. Two. 
The angle of the wound was not logical when considering the circumstances imposed by the first point. Rhonda would have had to have held the gun in an incredibly awkward position to have shot herself where the wound was located on her head, especially if she had been using her left hand. One last factor regarding the gun that has yet to be mentioned is the fact that the gun was fired through the pillow that was found over Rhonda's head. The likelihood of Rhonda using her left or even right hand to take her own life at such a strange angle, with the added reach needed to place the gun on the outside of the pillow over her head, is slim. Especially considering her hands were found underneath the electric blanket. Another thing to remember is that no fingerprints were found anywhere on the firearm, not even Rhonda's. As you will recall, when Rhonda was packing her belongings the day before her murder, she had the assistance of her friend, who had directly handled the gun. This friend had touched the gun, the holster, and a few bullets, yet his fingerprints were not found on the weapon at all. He testified in court that this was strange, describing how he felt he had handled the weapon more than enough to have his prints left on it. However, regardless of all this handling, no fingerprints were uncovered. Along with the ballistics evidence, the aforementioned testimony by her friends and family who were in communication with her at that time said that she wasn't suicidal. Coupled with the call me note on the mirror was fairly studied proof that Rhonda was not planning to take her own life. As you will recall, Rhonda not only had issues with Ron Reynolds, but also with one of his teen sons, Jonathan Reynolds. Theories that Jonathan had been humiliated by Rhonda, standing up to him the last time he had spied on her in the shower, created a possible motive. Something else Rhonda had mentioned to friends before her death was that Jonathan allegedly had issues with substances. There was no forensic evidence to back this claim, however. Regardless if Jonathan was abusing substances or not, the interpersonal issues between him and Rhonda were enough to make him look suspicious alongside his father. Ron and Rhonda's issues were examined before the jury as well, pointing out the possible financial motive regarding divorce settlements. Adding fuel to the fire that Ron was not the grieving husband that he claimed to be was an incident that took place the night after Rhonda was murdered. Whilst Rhonda's body sat in the morgue awaiting an autopsy, Ron went to sleep in his bed in the same room that Rhonda had died in only 24 hours earlier with his ex-wife. Ron denies that she stayed in the same bed as him that night, however his ex-wife claims that she had. Among the evidence pointing out Ron's strange behaviour was proof of a rather large and incredibly suspicious lie. In the initial police interview, Ron had said, quote, I put my fingers close to the neck to see if I could feel a pulse and I couldn't feel one and I immediately called 911. This claim directly contradicts something said when on the phone with a 911 dispatcher the morning that Rhonda was found dead. In the transcript of the 911 call, Ron proclaims to the dispatcher that his wife had killed herself with a pistol. The dispatcher asks if Ron had checked Rhonda's body for a pulse, to which Ron responds with, quote, No, I can go do that. It was not until the dispatcher directly encouraged Ron to go check for a pulse that he put the phone down to check for life in Rhonda. After reviewing the evidence and listening to testimony from various forensic experts and nearly 40 witnesses, the jury was left to deliberate. It took them 11 hours of discussion to come to their final decision in regards to the case. Rhonda Reynolds' death was not a suicide, nor was it undetermined any longer. Rhonda Reynolds had been murdered in the early morning hours of the 16th of December 1998. Finally, after 13 years of constant research, emotion and determination, Barbara Thompson and the loved ones of Rhonda Reynolds saw the cause of death added to Rhonda's death certificate that they had always felt belonged there. Barbara told reporters that she was relieved to know that the general public would finally know that her daughter had not taken her own life, but had had it taken away from her. But the inquest was not yet over. One final task needed to be completed by the jury in order for the inquest to truly conclude. The jurors were asked to name the people that they believed, beyond a reasonable doubt, killed Rhonda Reynolds. If they did so, arrest warrants would be issued. The jury deliberated for less than an hour and announced two names to the court, Ron Reynolds and Jonathan Reynolds. With that verdict reached, the coroner issued arrest warrants for both Ron Reynolds and his son Jonathan Reynolds, something that Rhonda's family had always hoped for. 
Ron and Jonathan quickly turned themselves over to the Lewis County Sheriff's Office once they were made aware of the warrant, not wishing to make their situations worse. However, the father-son duo would not be in custody long. After the initial ruling that Rhonda's death was a suicide, a large quantity of the original evidence and photos from the scene were destroyed due to the case being quite closed. Due to this, there was not enough evidence to hold either Ron or Jonathan for the murder of Rhonda. They were released the same day. Barbara Thompson would later say that though there was no true arrest or punishment for either of the two, she felt that justice had been served because, quote, for those few moments, they felt that they had been caught. And that brings us to the end of our coverage of this case. If you have a case that you want me to cover, head on over to requestacase.com and send in your submissions there. You can also see what other people have submitted and place your vote on what I should cover. So if you don't want to miss out on giving me your inputs, head on over to requestacase.com. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. You don't want to miss out on my live true crime deep dives that we do here on my YouTube channel almost every Saturday at 10 p.m. UK time. Thank you once again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. Grab your one month free trial using the links below. Also, if you want to hang out with a small community of people who like true crime content, join our Discord server for free. Again, you can find a link to that in the description. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. A special thank you to all of my Patreon members for helping keep this channel afloat, but especially thank you to my lead investigators for all of your support. If you'd like to support this channel for less than $5 a month, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash Joshua Miles.